Well, if you watch the previous video to this one, you would have seen me make a promise that a, another video on Levitical High Priest, fake Levitical High Priest, Seventh-day Adventist Jesus was going to be due, and here it is. This is that one I said I did not plan to make. So what I'm going to do in this is I'm really going to set the groundwork and framework and understand these books here that I'm going to be quoting. We're going to be looking at a pseudepigraphal work. Pseudepigraphal means false attributed work. And I've got a two volume set here on uh, the, the pseudepigrapher. I've got other books around me on, of course, other um, uh, translations of the pseudepigrapher. And this one that we're going to look at here is actually this book right here. It's called The Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. This one here is from 1908. And I have a, an earlier edition. This is an 1837 translation. These, both of these are going to be instrumental in this. Now this book, that's why it's called Falsely Attributed Work. This book is supposed to be the final utterances of Jacob's uh, 12 sons. All his 12 sons and the final things that they said ending with their death. Special honor in this book of the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs is given to Levi and Judah for obvious reasons. The priestly line and the kingly line. Now, this book, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, has been known for many hundreds of years. But here's something that's peculiar about it. So let's do a little history before we actually dive into it. Is that this book has a reputation of, it, it's, its history was, this book is was hidden, this Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs was hidden by the Jews from the Christians because the sneaky Jews knew that this had prophecies of Messiah. Just absurd. Absolutely absurd, but that was the reputation. That's how this book was spoken of. Now, how do we get to such an absurd charge as that? Well, let's do a little history of this book. Again, before we open it up, let's understand exactly what it is. We're going to go back 900 years. Look with me here. Here we have the scholar Peter Comastor. He wrote a book in 1173, and in that book, he says that the lost, the, the ten lost tribes, that who Alexander the Great locked up behind bars and iron gates and mountains. So he identifies the ten lost tribes locked up by Alexander the Great. Less than a hundred years from this man's book, the Mongols invaded largely Eastern European. It shook the European world. By the way, stop, pause the video, examine this this picture here. We do not look at pictures the way that they did in the 1200s or 1300s. Look at all the detail. Now this is from a book by a man named Matthew Paris. Here's what we need to know about Matthew Paris. He wrote a book in 1259, but before he published his book, his ideas were already out there. He took up Peter Comastor's idea of the Ten Lost Tribes and says, you know what, that mongrel invasion that we just read about in 1242, it's them. They're the Ten Lost Tribes. So in other words, it's the Jews who are attacking Eastern European, Eastern Europe that is. Then what he says, he floats the idea, he's attributed that this book that I showed you earlier, the 12 you know, patriarchs, that book, and he's the one that floated the idea, was hidden by the Jews from the Christians for the prophecies it has of the Messiah. Well, you know, all this does is set the stage for what? The Jews are the enemy. And setting the stage and spreading of it, oh yeah, it happens. Here we are in France, right? Across the ocean now, 1242. What do they do? You can you can just read the little excerpt here. King Louis, Louis the Ninth, or 24 wagon loads of handwritten Talmuds to be destroyed, burned in front of Notre Dame Cathedral. Right? Because what? The Jews are the enemies. And it continues. Let's continue here. In this whole historical framework is a bishop in London that you can see here. He sends an envoy to go search for this manuscript in Greek of the 12 lost, the, the 12 uh, patriarchs. He finds the manuscript, brings it back, translates it from Greek into Latin, completes it about the mid 1200s. By 1577, it's actually translated into English. There's your historical framework now for this book. And that's how it gets that 
inappropriate message that it's a secret book that, that well not secret to the Jews but to the Christians and they're trying to hide it because they got prophecies of the Messiah just a stupid idea just pick up the Bible if you want to read prophecies of Messiah and all right so anyway this idea that this you know testament of the 12 patriarchs is a you know book that's hidden hidden by the Jews is something that can it just it, it's an idea that lab, lived for a long time because here's my 1837 translation. And when you, you open this book up, like I'm going to do right now, and you start reading the very first words, guess what it says? It describes this book as something that was hidden by the Jews from the Christians because uh, prophecies of the Messiah. 1837. So this idea lived a very long time. It's dealt with in later books on the Pseudepigrapha, and it calls it out for the, for the silliness and absurdness that it is. Now, this book here, what's different from uh, the 1837 one is this one here is 1908. And this author here makes the claim that he is the first one to actually provide a commentary on the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. I'm going to run with it. I haven't seen every English edition printed since 1577. And, and his is 1908. So I'm going to take him at his word. And we're gonna, I'm going to assume that he's right. In his book... And you're going to see pictures of it. There's three columns of text. Because he had three manuscripts. He had a Greek manuscript, an Armenian manuscript, and a Slavic manuscript of this Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. Now, since 1908, when this book was published, much more has been discovered. And more manuscripts are available. Now, this two-volume set that I showed you here of the, of the Pseudepigrapha, which is a fantastic set, uh, critiques this 1908 book. And in terms of what... Mr. Charles here knew and didn't know in his book and what's been corrected and what we've learned, etc. Now, I, I didn't come upon this video, like I said, by accident and this book. I mentioned in the previous video, which is linked below, that I was reading all kinds of scholarly works on Hebrews 7, 11 to 28, which absolutely defeats Adventism. I came across a narrative text in one of the authors that I read, and he cited this book. When he cited it, my first reaction, I'm sitting right here in this chair and I said, no way. No way am I reading what I think I'm reading. I dropped everything. I went and got this book and I opened it up and I read it and I went, yes way. He is absolutely correct. And I was blown away and I said, this is going to to be a video because what he did in that book in Hebrews he cited a passage from this book which is the original manuscript about 2,000 years ago uh, that we're going to read shortly so closely parallels the investigative judgment I couldn't ignore it this video had to be made when I read the quote here in this book and I'm, I'm sitting here shocked going You've got to be kidding me, because I've always said the investigative judgment is one of the original things of Seventh-day Adventism. It's like, no, it's not. Not now. I just changed my mind, because now I got the evidence. I thought of Ecclesiastics 1, 9 through 10. There is nothing new under the sun. Look with me here. Ecclesiastics 1, 1. Let's just read it and set the tone. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Uh, what does man gain? by all the toil in which he toils under the sun. A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun goes down, and hastens to a place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, goes to the north, around and around the wind goes, and its circuits and the wind, and circuits and the wind returns. All streams run into the sea, but the sea is not full, to the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Here's the key point. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing which it is said, see, this is new. And our author says, it's already been done ages before us. The phrase under the sun, is used about 28 times in 26 verses in the book of Ecclesiastes. By the way, the phrase under the sun is a semantic description of what man is doing on the earth. Let me say it like this. Under the sun is limited. 
The phrase under the sun is not describing anything in the book of Ecclesiastics that happens in heaven. It is not describing anything that happens after death. It's always on the earth. <clears throat> Hence, Ecclesiastes 9.5 is so um, easily refuted just by what I just said. I've already done videos on that. Really what Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 11 is just citing the absurdity, absurdities and just endless cycles of man's life. Now here's what he is, he is not saying. He is not saying in Ecclesiastes when he said there's nothing new under the sun that there's nothing new. Because all you got to do is read the Bible. I'm just going to give you a couple examples. Isaiah 66, we got a new heaven. We got a new earth. We got Jeremiah 31, we got a new covenant coming. So he's not saying there's nothing new. What he is saying, though, is that human perceived novelty of ideas is an illusion. That's what he's saying right there. To call some thought new, really, in his mind, the author of Ecclesiastes 1, in his mind, is to display an appalling lack of knowledge of the past. You just don't know. It's already happened, is what he is saying. Verse 9 really summarizes the previous text, which is just the futility and endless cycles of man's life. And you think you discovered something new? No, you haven't. Adventist, you think the investigative judgment is something supposed to be like new and novel? For, it's not in the Bible. Uh, no, it's not. And, and we are going to see it. Because like I said, I used to say the investigated judgment was the one unique thing in Adventism. No more will I ever utter those words. I can't say that any longer. So at its core, what is the investigated judgment? It's an angelic being, Michael the Archangel, who they call Christ, in heaven, conducting a bloodless atonement. You know, since 1844. That's the investigated judgment at its, at its core elements. Investigative judgment Jesus. Adventist investigative judgment Levitical priest Jesus, fake, is in heaven right now atoning for sins and not shedding any blood. Well, see, that's a problem, right? Because what does Hebrews 9.22 say? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Investigative judgment Jesus can't forgive a single sin because there's no blood being shed. Now remember, there is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10. What you're going to see now is a passage of text from this book that was written about 250 BC. You are going to see a passage in this text of angelic beings in heaven atoning for sins bloodlessly. Did you just catch what I said? How is anything I said any different than the core elements of the investigated judgment? They're not. That's what you're going to see in this book. It's the book of Levi, chapter 3, verses 3 through 6. And let's look here. All right, here's the very book that I held up. This is my 1908 edition with commentary. We are going to look at three, these three pages. We're going to look at these three uh, verses. Verses, well, four verses. Three, four, five, and six on these three pages. And I'm going to now blow them up so we can all read them. And we're going to start reading in verse 3. And you can see the red arrow. And those in the fourth... What they're doing in this book, by the way, they're describing levels of heaven. The first level of heaven, second, third, now we're at the fourth level. So again, I'll start reading here at the verse. And those in the fourth level of heaven who are above, these are holy. Verse 4. For in the highest of all dwelleth the great glory in holy of holies, far above the holiness. And in the heaven next to, now we're talking the, ne the heaven realm next to the highest of level, which were in the fourth level, it are the, so what's going on in this level? It's the angels of presence of the Lord who minister and make propitiation. Did you catch that? Angels in heaven making an atonement, and let's keep reading, a, a propitiation, which is an atonement, to the Lord for the sins of ignorance, and, and of the righteous. And they offer to the Lord a sweet-smelling Savior, a reasonable and bloodless offering. We just read an account, 2,000 years old, of angelic beings in heaven atoning for sins without blood. That is no different than the Adventist investigative judgment, is it? None. The Adventist Levitical priest, 
Michael the Archangel, angelic being, Jesus, is doing exactly the same thing. When I read this quote, when I picked up this book and read that from my, my, book, my books on Hebrews are sitting over here, and I read those, I went, oh, there is nothing new under the sun. It's already all been done. And here it is. Proof. But it gets better. Remember this book said, it's the first one to actually publish a commentary. We're now going to look at the middle page of the three that we just looked at, which is page 33. We're going to look at the commentary section on the ministering angels making an atonement. So look with me here. So here it is, page 33, and here's the commentary on this section of text about the angels making atonement. Read with me here, starting with the words, according to the rabbinic, rabbinic tradition as given by Rabbi Mir, 2nd century A.D., in the fourth heaven called Zebul were to be found what? Jerusalem, the temple, the altar, and what? Michael the great prince. There we go. We have Michael the archangel in this literature, in this temple, with these angels making this bloodless atonement. Rhetorical question here. Um, how is anything we just read different from the investigative judgment? It's not. Again, at its core elements, it is not. It is identical. Yes, I know the investigative judgment for Adventist started in 1844. Minor difference. Core elements, angelic being, in heaven, making an atonement, bloodlessly. Those are the core elements of the investigative judgment. Those are the core elements of this heretical book here, supposedly written by the 12 sons of Jacob. Piece of fiction. Investigated judgment. Likewise, a piece of fiction. You know, so let's just do something else before we wind this down. Here's my 1837 translation. Uh, so it's a different translation of the text. It's an older book. Probably He does not have the benefit of all the manuscripts he had in 1908. And of course, we know this 1908 book is even dated because now I got a really good critique of it done here in, in this two-volume set by Mr. James Charlesworth. But let's look at it anyway and see what it says. It says essentially the same thing. Look here. So there's the spine from 1837. There's the title page. And here's the book of Levi with the red arrow. In the fourth above, and we already know it's the fourth heaven, these are saints. For in the higher places dwelleth great glory in the holy of all the holies above all holiness. In the next unto this, right, one level, heaven level down, the angels do service in God's presence and seek favor in all the ignorance of the righteousness. They offer to the Lord the sweet Savior of a reasonable sacrifice, service, a sacrifice without blood. Just another way to say the same thing. It's a bloodless atonement. So there it is. Angelic beings called Michael in the commentary here in 250 BC. There's truly nothing new under the sun. Now here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying Seventh-day Adventists copied from the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. I'm not saying that at all. I don't think they did. Here's what I am saying. What I am saying is that we humans, we are limited in our creativity. You know how I know that? Look with me here. For what has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing which is said, see, this is new. It's already been before us. We are limited by our creativity. That's all that happened in Seventh-day Adventism. I don't think they copied from this book. But again, we as humans are limited, and we keep saying the same things over and over and over. This heretical investigative judgment is not new. Ecclesiastes 1, 9, and 10 prove it. There's nothing new under the sun. In this case, what has been repeated is heretical doctrine spoken 2,000 years ago in this heretical book. That's all the investigative judgment is. Heretical doctrine repeated from something 2,000 years old. Adventism defeated.